welcome to the HTO channel. I am so glad you are here today. Um, I don't think you're here by accident. I'm excited. I hope you're excited. Just buckle up. We're going to just jump right in and just see what the Holy Spirit has for us today. I will take you through on our new journey. But before we do, let's begin with a word of prayer. You know, in his word, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, it says, But he answering said, It has been written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word coming forth from the mouth of God. And that's the LSV version. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you today. God, we invoke Matthew 4, 4, and we know that we can't live without your word. So help us, God, as we begin this new journey in you to be able to walk according to your precepts and to understand what the Spirit is saying to the church. We bless you, Father, for you are a good, good God. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for caring for us. Help us to understand your word as we begin this new reading plan where we can fellowship and commune with you we bless you, God. I thank you for everyone under the sound of my voice that we will all be changed, Father, through your written word. For you say your word is alive and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. And so we bless you and thank you for being mindful and faithful unto us this day. For it is in Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. So everybody, as I mentioned earlier, we are going to be stepping into a new journey. So I invite you to read the Bible with me. We're going to start a new journey and it's called the Chronological Bible Reading Plan. And I'll be more specific and take you through this. Um, we're going to lay the foundation and just jump in. If you've uh, been on my channel before, we've done some plans. We started with the full story. I've shown you how to do a chronological Bible study in a physical Bible. But today we're going to just start with something new and I pray that it will encourage you. I pray that the Holy Spirit has led you here and that today will be the first day of the rest of all of our lives. So let's just get started. Before we do, let's first define the problem, okay? We're going to talk about, you know, what's the issue? Why do we need to even read the Bible in the first place? And to start this, to actually start this off, we're going to look at some, the data is a little old. Um, I just pulled it today. So if you want to find something more recent, but it still should just give us an idea of the old, overall picture. And the first I'm going to look at is the literal standard version Bible this is their landing page, and I thought that was a great way to start out this discussion. And so it says 2 billion, let me make that a little bit bigger for you, 2 billion of the world's over 8 billion inhabitants speak English. 143 out of 162 English Bible translations are in contemporary English. 61% of American Bible readers prefer word for word translation. Now that's a little sticky because what we know is that when you're going from one language to the, to the next, it's difficult to get word for word. So the way you should understand that is as close as we possibly can get. Okay. Then it says 55% of American Bible readers use the 400 year old KJV. So one out of two people read out of the KJV translation. And remember, that's just America, not the world. Only 24% of Americans believe the Bible is the literal word of God. So now we're getting into the problem. Okay. Only 12 out of 162 complete English translations are literal and zero translations are strictly literal and in modern English until now. So they're giving you their foundation for why they have created this version. This video is not really going to get into translations. I'll mention a few things about it. I will say this is one of my, um, top, but what I want you to look and focus on is that statement where it says only 24% of Americans believe the Bible is the literal word of God. So we're getting into the problem. We're getting into the problem. And even if they do believe it, that only 12 out of 162 English translations are literal. So most of our modern translations range from uh, anywhere from word for word 
to a paraphrase. That's more of where they're giving you the interpretation as they have read and studied the actual scriptures. Okay, so that starts us off. Keep in mind, we're going to talk about the problem. Now, the next one is, um, this is from the American Bible Society. And we're just going to look at some quick data. Again, I encourage you to do your own research with that. And the question is, what do Americans think about the Bible? And it says the Bible's influence in the U.S. First, let's look at how Americans see both the Bible and the Bible's impact on the nation. Over half of U.S. adults, 54%, believe that America would be worse off without the Bible, which is actually a 5% increase since last year, which is 49, it was 49% in 2020, okay? And again, they 54% believe that America would be worse off. So we're, we got some hope. Then it says one in seven Americans, that's 14%, believe the nation would be better without the Bible essentially the same as last year's 13%. While the proportion with the more negative view remained about the same, there has been a shift from last year for those in the middle. One in three American adults, that's 33%, believe America would be the same with or without the Bible. 5% of those who were ambivalent last year have moved to a more Bible-affirming view in 2021. Now remember, this is we're in 2024. Do you think, so here's a question that was posed. Do you think our country would be worse off, better off, or about the same without the Bible? 54% people of the people said, or responders said, they would be worse off without the Bible. 33% said it'd be about the same. 14% said we'd be better off without the Bible. Okay. So here's, you know, there's the problem. And here's the power of influence. We don't want the 14% to influence the 54% or the 33%. Okay, here it is. This belief in the Bible's value to the United States aligns with the sense that the Bible upholds American values. Faith, um, here are some of the American values. Faith, hope, and love, among other qualities, are widely agreed upon as values the Bible is essential for sustaining. Of the listed American values, only democracy failed to garner agreement from a majority of respondents when asked if the Bible's teachings are essential to sustaining the following American ideals. While only 44% agree that the Bible's teaching underpin American democracy, just one in four disagrees, leaving nearly one third unsure about the connection between the Bible and democracy. Again, this is called State of the Bible, but it's 2021, three years old. Um, you know, if I had more time, I would have tried to dig around for something uh, more recent. You can actually do that. Uh, it says the Bible's teachings are essential to sustaining the following American ideals. So that was the question that's posed. The blue are the respondents that disagree, and the yellows are the ones that agree. So 13% believe that the Bible sustains, the teachings found in the Bible sustains faith. 72% believe uh, that they do. 13% believe that it does not. As far as hope is concerned, 14% disagree that the Bible's teaching teachings are essential to sustaining hope. 71% agreed that the Bible does sustain hope. 15% disagree that the Bible's teachings are essential to sustaining love. 69% of, of those who responded agreed that the Bible's teachings do sustain the following ideal of love. Unity, 64, 17% disagree that the Bible is essential to establishing and sustaining the ideal of unity. 64% of the people agree that the Bible is essential to sustaining uh, unity. 20% 20, 20 disagree that the Bible helps, the teachings in the Bible help to sustain the idea of justice. 57% agreed. 21% believe or disagree that the Bible help the teachings help to sustain liberty. 51% agree that the Bible does. The teachings found in the Bible help to sustain the ideal of liberty. 
25% disagree that the Bible's teachings help to sustain democracy. 44% agree that the Bible's teachings do sustain uh, b democracy, the ideal of democracy. Now you can read that on your own um, time. There are 266 pages in this report, but I thought that, that we needed to look at that, although outdated. Um, I don't, I would doubt that it's changed that much, but again, I invite you to actually look that up. So we're talking about the problem. That's state of the Bible. Now here is, uh, just some information from Lifeway. And so I just wanted to share just this portion for, uh, from this. And this is also based on 2000, May 20, uh, May, what was that? May 28th, 2021. It says the latest state of the Bible report from American Bible Society finds 181 million Americans open a Bible in the past year, which is up 7.1% from the previous year. Now, remember we, we went through COVID and all that. And so what they're saying is that may have had some impact. All right, but here's the part I wanted to emph emphasize. It says, how much um, of the Bible have you personally read? Now we looked at it as far as the nation, we also have to look at the problem as far as community and we have to look at it individually. So this pie chart will give us an idea. Again, this is based on 2021. It says that 10% have read none of it. 13% have only uh, read a few sentences, 30% several passages or stories. So that's 30, 43, that's about 53% of Americans uh, have responded, basically have not read a whole lot of the Bible. And then we have 15% who said they've read at least half of it, 12%, almost all of it, 11%, all of it, and 9%, all of it more than once. And so we see it's all, almost half. And so again, we're addressing what is the problem? What is the problem? And so again, you can read, look into that on your own and on your own time, excuse me. And so here's a quick Bing search that I did, and I'm sorry, but I didn't uh, get the date on this actual report. It might be around the same time, but it says just one third of US adults, 34% reads the Bible once a week or more, while 50% read the Bible less than twice a year, including never. One third of Americans who attend Protestant church regularly, 32% say they read the Bible personally every day, while around a quarter, 27% say they read it a few times a week. One in five Americans. Okay, guys, sorry, my alarm went off, but I'm back. All right, here, let's continue. One third of Americans who attend Protestant church, I think we uh, read that, but let me read again. Who attend Protestant church regularly, 32% say they read the Bible personally every day, while around a quarter, 27% say they read it a few times a week. One in five Americans has read through the Bible at least once, including 11% who've read the entire Bible once and 9% who've read it through multiple times. About a third of Americans, 35% say they read scripture at least once a week, while 45% seldom or never read scripture. Less than 30%, now here's the population, of over 2 billion Christians in the world will ever read through the entire Bible, and over 82% of Christian Americans only read their Bible on Sundays while in church. So we are defining the problem. We're defining the problem. You can do your own research. I encourage you to find something, you know, a little later to our time frame. I'm wondering, has it changed much? Okay. But the question is, what does God think about all this? What does God say about a nation who says, according to statistics, that we do not value his word? Or in other words, we don't value his word to make it a priority, enough of a priority. So here it is, Hosea chapter four, verses six through 12. It's appropriate for us to go to God's word to see what he said and see what he thinks about it. So Hosea, again, let me read that for you again. Chapter four, verses six through 12. And it reads, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you, the priestly nation have rejected knowledge. I will also reject you that you shall be no priest to me. So let's qualify that. 
You know, there are a lot, we have to remember that the Bible is alive and powerful. It speaks over generations. And so you have some who will say, well, this was Hosea. This doesn't apply to us. This is the old Testament. Okay. I would suggest that we understand that his methods may have changed, but his attributes don't. So the priestly nation, we have the Israelites and then we have the, the Gentiles who've been circumcised into the, the priestly nation of God, into the kingdom of God. And so he still feels the same way that we should prioritize knowing him and his ways. And it, let me continue reading. Seeing you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. The more they increased and multiplied in prosperity and power, the more they sinned against me, I will change their glory into shame. They feed on the sin of my people and set their heart on their iniquity. And it shall be like people, like priests. I will punish them for their ways and repay them for their doings. For they shall eat and not have enough. They shall play the harlot and beget no increase. Because they have forsaken the Lord for harlotry. Harlotry and wine and new wine take away the heart and the mind and the spiritual understanding. My people habitually ask counsel of their senseless wood idols. And their staff of wood gives them oracles and instructions and instructs them for the spirit of harlotry has led them astray and they have played the harlot withdrawing themselves from subjection to their God. That's powerful. Okay. And so by the spirit, I say, let us all hear what the spirit is saying to the church in Hosea four, six. And this is just a quick bing I did. The phrase, my people perish for a lack of knowledge, is a biblical quote from Hosea 4 and 6. It means that ignorance or lack of knowledge is a destructive state. The quote suggests that people who reject knowledge will be rejected by God. And I want you to pay attention to where it says destructive state. All we have to do is look around, look at uh, the, the situations that's going on in our nation. Hey, let's continue. The consequences of this lack of knowledge can be severe, including hunger, thirst, and death. The quote has been interpreted to mean that many lives have been lost, many cruel deeds have been done, and many souls have perished on account of a lack of knowledge. So what is the problem? We've defined the problem. So the question is, now what? What do we do to strategize? And I just want to take this time to thank the Holy Spirit because when I say this has been downloaded to me all in one day, and so I am getting and getting a grip just like all of us are. Okay, now what? A new start. And so if you've struggled with how to approach Bible study and um, how to approach uh, understanding God's word, this channel, this Oh, I'm going to call it a read, reading program because it's through you version will help us to understand, to understand so that we can live a life that's pleasing before God. Not perfectly. That's why we have Christ, but I'm just here to come alongside of you and just provide some resources for you to help you in this journey that we are going to do together. I need you to pray for me. And as well, I am praying or I have prayed for you in the sense right now that it'll be the first day of the rest of your life. Now for me, every, you know, God deals with people differently. For me, it's when I pray, he gives me a strategy. And so what I'm doing is I'm just sharing the strategy he gave to me with you today. I didn't even want to pause. So I'm going to be starting it right along with you today. So what is our strategy? Let me first define my part. My part is not to come alongside um, and take place of what the Holy Spirit is going to do with you in your personal fellowship communion time with him. My part is just to be a facilitator, to be a guide, to help you to structure your learning as you learn about God and who he is, about Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, about the Holy Spirit. And so I would say this channel would serve as being a facilitator. Um, What can you expect from me? I will come. I I want to say this on the low end. Uh, I pray to give you these uh, readings daily 
And then with those readings, and when I say daily, I mean right around five days a week. If you want to do more, um, you can. But around about five days a week, a time for us to do some other things as far as uh, the word is concerned. Still read, but just be more flexible. Um, and also, you can expect that as the Lord leads, I will post a teaching a minimum of once a month. So that we um, can just look back and take a deep dive into what we're studying. Okay, so you're invited to participate in that. I'll also share resources with you. I'm going to share a few with you today. And then those resources, I encourage you to always look in the description box so you can click on those and delve uh, further into it. And so here are first the first few resources. I've done some videos on BibleHub.com and Blue Letter Bible, so I'm not going to go in depth. Um, you can see that on, on the channel, but I will just share a few things with you. So let's just start with BibleHub.com. So if you go directly to that website, you will land on this page. The first section up here gives you all your different translations. Uh, one day, not today, we will talk about as God leads, uh, translations. I just, you know, don't have time, uh, on this video to, to delve, delve into it, but your translations for Bible hub are all, all up here. And then if you click on the version select selector, it will also give you even more versions. Um, I love the, this little area right here. If you click on Strong's KJV, if you're in the KJV and you're reading along, you can highlight and they have every word hyperlink. So if I click on God, it'll give me the transliteration and the Strong's number, which is Elohim. Okay. And then you can scroll down and you can look at definitions and, you know, so on and so forth. So that is uh, BibleHub.com. The second layer that they have built in on this web page is they give you good tools. And again, I won't go through all of them, but you can click the parallel and see the different translations based on the verse you're looking at. You can click on sermons and hear sermons from, from the verse you are looking at. Now, here's the one that I really um, actually ask, uh, believe that you should print out and keep bookmark on your page. And that is the timelines. So that when you're reading, we're going to be doing a chronological uh, Bible study. I mean, and so what you can do is you'll always know where you are located in time as you read according to chapter. So when you read Genesis 37, it's around 1898 BC when Joseph's dreams and betrayal. So this is a powerful tool to use. They have the complete Bible, biblical timeline up here. Okay. And so that's T-I-M. Here for QUE, I will post a link. And even if I don't, you can always come here after you read your, we, you go through your chapter. Now, what I'll say to you is what I'm going to help structure is through the power of you version is your reading time. Your reading time is separate from your study time. And I'm still working on that because sometimes you can get lost in the weeds, looking up cross references and everything else. So what I found over my years is that it's best for me to have a time to read and then a time to study and dive a little uh, deeper. So you can use these questions for those of you who like to journal and you can use these questions as prompts, as review questions to see how much um, you remember. They have topical uh did I skip that? I'm sorry. I forgot. I went through this third line without going, finishing the second line. So we have audio, we have visuals. If you want to post like Instagram or on your social media, um, just to he help to spread the gospel, you have commentaries where you can, if you're studying a particular verse or a section or a passage, they have all these, uh, commentaries that you can use interlinear for those of you've been doing this a while. Um, I like using interlinears because um, it just helps me to dive deep and I can look behind the translation that I'm given. So for instance, if I'm in Genesis 1 and I know that the Old Testament is written in Hebrew and in Aramaic, um, I can come to my interlinear. So for instance, they, in Hebrew, it's right to left. So I would read in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So if I wanted to know the Hebrew name for God in, uh, in Hebrew, I would just click on 430 and it would give me my strongs. That's what I showed you earlier. 
God, in this sense, the transliteration is Elohim. And so you can see how you can actually um, use that as a good study tool. And then you have Hebrew, you have lexicon, then you have Strong's numbers, and then you have um, the multilingual uh, section. And so let me close that out. We don't want to translate that just yet. Um, but so those, that's your second layer. Your third layer, again, you have summaries where they give you book by book. You have an outline where they'll break it down for you. You have the timeline, which I've already shown you the questions you have here, the, um, topical, uh, Bible, or it's the dictionary of Bible themes based on topics. You have here Wilmington's Bible at a glance. You have parallel chapters. So if you're looking at a verse or, or an, actually an entire chapter, you can compare NIV, ESV, NASB, KJV, and the Holman. And then you have uh, what we call the parallel study Bible, where you have the English study Bible on the left, and then the Hebrew words on the right. When you go to the New Testament, it would be in Greek. Then you have what I think is very um, helpful is the treasury of scripture knowledge. If you're reading Genesis 1-1 and now you're in your study time, not in your reading time, you can go to this section. And for instance, based on that key word in the scripture where it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, I can find cross references based on that key word beginning. I scroll down, I can find cross references based on the, uh, God. And so again, that's available to you. They have a library and then they also have what they call the apostolic uh, Bible polyglot. The difference between that is that the Old Testament, I may have not heard of this before, but for those of you who have, the Old Testament is based on the Septuagint, I believe, and not the Masoretic text. If you've never heard about that, don't worry about that. And then you have the Septuagint here. Okay. And so um, and the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. And so that's BibleHub.com, a very valuable um, resource. Over here, what I like about this is you can actually click on a particular Bible um, a version and they will allow you to download it in a PDF form. You could create a, t a digital Bible uh, on your tablet and you can make annotations. So those are two powerful uh, resources that during your study time, I would encourage you to actually um, use. All right, so those are the first two beginning resources. Now let's look at these additional two. Um, we're gonna look at, it's called the Chronological Bible Teaching website. And so you can go directly to that chronologicalbibleteaching.com. You can ex uh, explore this website, but what I wanted to do is share with you on this website, they've created, in addition to the timeline that I showed you on Bible Hub, I would suggest you read through this and print it out because she's created 14 eras so that when you're reading through the Bible, you'll, you'll, you'll have an idea of where you are in history and you'll find that the reading plan will give us a snapshot too. This one is a little bit more detailed. So if you print this out and have this available to you or bookmark it, you can always know, okay, what, what era am I in? And so let me list the 14. It's the creation era, the patriarch era, the exodus era, the conquest era, judges era, the kingdom era, uh, the divided kingdom. So the word tells you right there what's going on in history. Right. So when you're reading second Kings, second Chronicles, Obadiah, you're seeing, you know, what's the state of God's people of the Israelites at that time, the captivity era, uh, when Babylon swoops in, we, we can see what's going on return era. This is the Hebrews of Southern Judah spent 70 years as Babylonian captivities, captives, right? So those are the books, Nehemiah, Ezra, and so on the silent era. She tells you about those 400 years, the gospel era. When we learn uh, here, we get the narration from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the church era, which starts in acts, the missions era. Then we also see the end and new, <clears throat> excuse me, new beginning era. If you scroll down, you can click there 
And I would suggest that you would go ahead and print that out. And you can always have that by you when you are in your actual study time. And so that's the Chronological Bible Teaching website. Now this uh, Wycliffe, um, he, they are the creators of the actual Chronological Bible plan that we're going to use on version. And God bless version for all the work that they've done to help all of us. But I thought this was a good um, website because it gives you the some actual resources that you can look at. For example, let's say you're reading about the tabernacle. You could click on this Appendix D and they show you the plan of the tabernacle and the court. So that's a good uh, uh, website that I would also suggest that you would bookmark and can use. All right, so those are some resources and this is, since this is the first video, it's, take, it's going to, I'm just trying to be more precise, um, but there will be times when on the daily Bible reading that you will uh, click in the description box and you will see additional resources or I will embed or discuss it in the actual video. So our chronological Bible reading plan will be coming from you version. And so I'm going to walk you through if you do not have an account, one of the first things you want to do is set up the account. Now, now the title of that actual uh, reading plan is called Reading the Bible in Historical Sequence. And today we are actually going to do the first day together. Okay, and so you'll check. Now pray for me, y'all. My goal is to put these daily readings out, not teachings. You'll check the, the actual uh, channel for the times when I will put, a, put out an actual teaching, a line by line teaching, okay? But one thing I want you to remember, you're gonna go to, you're going to go to Bible.com, that's you version, and you're going to proceed with a commitment at your pace. What I found even in my own personal experience and just reading a lot, that a lot of people fall off of the reading plans because it's almost like we get discouraged when we fall behind. Commit, make a commitment, but make it at your pace because your day is not like my day. My day is not like your day. We have different responsibilities. But what we want to do is we want to remember that God, we don't live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So just like we eat food daily, we want to take in the word daily, okay? But if your dates get off, there's no condemnation. We just jump straight back in, okay? And so I'm going to show you if you, when you go to Bible.com or to you version, you'll see the headings up here. And then if you look at the menu, I've already done it, but you want to go ahead and create, they'll give you an opportunity to install the app on your phone or your tablet. And then you also want to create an account because this account will save your highlights and you can make notes and all that other good stuff. Okay. So that's Bible.com. That's where you're going to actually uh, go to, to get started. Remember a commitment that every day I will feed and fellowship and commune with God and his Holy Spirit. Now, one thing I also want to tell you is we want to begin each day with prayer. We want to begin each day with prayer. And a good way also is to begin, version has a daily Bible verse. You can swoop right into that app or on your computer and pray and start your day with that daily Bible verse. And we're going to actually start that today. And we're going to look at today's actual uh, verse. Now, if you're on the computer, on the app, it's real, you know, it's up there at the front. If you have iOS, it's right up at the top. Android, it should be the same. They have it on Google Play, the App Store, and then also on the Amazon App Store. So on the computer, it looks a little different, but let's just go through it as an example. So let's say we're coming, you're clicking on the, the reading for the day. The first thing you're, you should tap into is the verse of the day. And it says for today, and check this out, y'all. Seems so appropriate for what we're talking about. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. 
right? He's saying hearing his voice. And what are the ways? There are ways that we hear his voice, but one of the most crucial way to hear his voice is to read his word. Let's read it again. Revelation 3 and 20. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. And so that's how we want to start out our daily reading. And you'll see the structure as you continue to come to the channel and hear your actually your actual uh, daily reading for the day. And again, we're looking at um, the the chronological reading plan. And so what I want to do first is show you how to get to that. And so when you go to the Bible.com, you're going to come over to where you see um, reading plan. So you'll see that mine is already up there and started. Let me go ahead. You would click on find plans. And so the title is reading the Bible in historical sequence. So we'll, I'll pretend like I haven't done it yet. And so I'm going to, you would type it in reading the Bible in historical sequence. Okay. And so when you do your search, you're going to end up and they're going to be out of order. Okay. You see it's, there are 12 parts. I love that. It's like for the 12 disciples. Uh, I'm sorry, 12 apostles, 12 parts. And so it's going to be out of order. So what I would suggest is you start with part 12 for, well, not start, but click on part 12 first. And then for each of these, you have to click start this plan. I'm not going to click it because I've already done it and it will duplicate it, but you would click start this plan. And then you go back, you just go back to where it says uh, plans again, find plans, and then I already have it typed in there. They actually, they don't, it doesn't show up the way, um, here we go, let's see, let me just type it in. I thought it would do it. Reading the Bible in historical sequence. On the app, I don't think you have to type um, all of this in like I'm doing here on the computer. So reading the Bible in historical sequence, that's plans, find plans. Sorry, I still didn't do it. Let me try it again. Reading the Bible in historical sequence. All right, so I did 12, and so the next time you would do 11, and then 10, and then 9, and then 8. So you got to hit start this plan on each one of those. And they're going to ask you, do you want to do this privately, uh, by yourself, or with, with friends? It's really up to you. I always hit private. You know, I would suggest you go through it by yourself first and then possibly invite friends, but whatever the, the Lord is leading you to do. So when you get done, it should look like mine. So since I started at 12, what will happen is it will list it from 1 to 12. So that's why I told you to hit 12 first, hit start plan, work backwards, so that when you go to your app, they'll it'll be listed in order from 1 to 12. Okay, that's not that big of a deal, but I just wanted mine in order like that. So that's why I did it that way. All right, so that is the plan that you're gonna we're going to kick this ball game off with. It's called Reading the Bible in historical sequence, part one. So let me say one thing to you. Um, even in the life application chronological Bible, what they say is that, you know, some people feel that you should still read your Bible in the standard order, in the canonical order, like you normally see it, Genesis all the way through Revelation. Now, depends on your time. You know, some people read solely the chronological Bible just to get an idea of the overall story. That's what I'm doing. And I, I because I have time, am weaving in also reading it, the whole chapters as well. So it's really based on what you can do. But as far as this channel is concerned, I will be taking you through chronologically, okay? I will be reading through it with you chronologically using you version. Okay. So that's how we're going to start this climb off. And we're going to read again. It's called reading the Bible in historical sequence. Ensure that you have created an account so you can save 
all of your um, actual work, okay? And so let's we're gonna pause right here because that lays your foundation. Um, we're a few minutes in. We're going to start day one together. We've already done the memory, well, you could call it a memory verse. Um, you could use that to commit to memory. By the way, one of the things that I want to mention is Take a minute and even research scripture writing. What I plan on doing is taking that daily Bible verse from you version and as the Lord leads, do scripture writing. Um, There's some research that talks about how we retain information and some data shows that when you handwrite something, it's uh, you tend to retain it more than when you type. So I'm going to try it. I've already started it. And now that God has given me this strategy, I'm hoping now that I can be more consistent with that. You could just get a journal and just do your scripture writing. You can even um, elaborate on that one scripture as God has uh, uh, led you to do. But again, for for you, this channel's purposes, I'm coming alongside of you to just read with you. You're going to read with me. And then occasionally you will get an instructional video where we go line by line, verse by verse. So if you're ready, let's go ahead. Hopefully you can pause the video here to set up your account so that you can jump straight in with me or you could do it later and just follow along with me as we read through today's first reading. And may the Lord bless us in all that we put our hands to. Okay, so remember when you do your search, it's reading the Bible in historical sequence. There are 12 parts that you will start, sign up for and start. And I want to tell y'all too, if y'all hear my Alexa, just ignore it, okay? I mean, I try to do everything I could to turn everything off, but just ignore it. All right, so we're going to do part one. We're working on part one. One thing I love about this is that it gives you a good milestone. You know, because each of these parts, there are 12 parts and they're meant so that you create, you finish one part in 30 to 31 days. And again, no condemnation. Don't worry about the dates that you see. We just see that we are daily feeding on his word. And so here again, this is what you would see. They're out of order when you do the search. But once you've done it correctly, when you click on plans, you should see it should say my plans and then it will show one through 12. Okay. So mine shows some progress because I, I was clicking around. So they actually have me on day two. So I'm going to go to day one so that you can see exactly. Well, I'm, I'm, they have me on day two of part one. Okay. Because remember each month we're going to work on a part. So I'm going to have to backtrack on mine. So this says day two, I am going to have to go back to day one. I hope they'll allow me to do that. Okay, let's see here. Yep, they did. And so when you click on it, you won't have check marks, okay? Because I went through because I was, you know, pre-recording and so I, I have my, mine are checked in, but yours will not be checked in. Now, one thing I also like about it is remember those two resources I gave you? I said that the additional two were the, uh, the 14 eras, the, the chronological Bible teaching.com website and the, um, Wycliffe, the makers of this, uh, uh, this reading plan. Um, you could print that information out so that you have it while you're reading. So let's just jump in. One thing I love is they'll actually start us off with a good devotional, the devotional will be like this trailer that you usually get when you're getting ready to watch a movie or before you watch a movie. Okay. So let's just jump in. So I'm hoping it'll let me backtrack. Right. So here, they did. So here it is. One of eight day one of 31. It should take us 30 days, 30 days. It doesn't necessarily remember we're giving ourselves some room because we'll have 30 days of reading, but if we fall behind for some reason and we're still reading 30 days in the next month, it is what it is, no condemnation. We just keep plugging around long. All right, let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger. Okay, I'm on, on the largest setting. 
All right, so let's just jump. Let me see if I can just zoom in for you. So it says in 4004 BC. So we see right there, if we looked at our errors, we would know exactly where we were. If we looked at the biblical timeline on Bible Hub, we'd know exactly where we were. It says in the beginning, God creates the universe, speaking it into being. In creation week, he separates light from darkness, sky from water, land from sea. He creates a perfect garden for Adam and Eve. Lucifer, who is the guardian angel of God's throne, wants to be like the most high. He is demoted, but is still allowed to roam the heavens and the earth. He deceives Eve and then Adam. First note, most of the dates used in this series of 12 plans are the biblical dates first calculated by Archbishop Usher of Ireland in approximately AD 1650. Note two, in the Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Genesis three passages, star of the morning and king of Tyre or Tyre seem to refer to Satan to whom God had given the special role of guarding the Garden of Eden. So I like that devotional because they set the scene. Okay, and if you look down here too to the right, I'm not gonna click on it. If you click on videos, explore and see if you can find videos on Genesis chapter. We're reading Genesis chapter, where were we? Uh, one, well, we'll get to it. It'll tell us exactly. So let's click continue. And so this is still day one of 31. This is part two of eight sections. Now notice one thing you want to do, and again, I don't want to go into this about translations and all of that. I'll just tell you some of uh, my favorite ones, maybe in another video, but one I tend to lean, lean towards what we read. I prefer as close as we can get the translators to a word for word translation. Okay. That does not mean you won't see me studying and looking at a verse in the message Bible, because I just want to breathe some more life on that. Okay. But it, it does mean that when I'm doing more serious study that I want to lean as close as I possibly can to, um, the original words based on what the archeologists archeolo have actually found. So one is modern English version. I use that one, um, quite a bit. I use the uh, modern English version. The LSV is not on here. Um, I sometimes use that. Of course, I use the KJV. I use the, um, I don't use the NKJV as much, but I will say to you that there are quite a few that I will still use as a supplement to the primary um, translation that I have uh, selected, okay? So that just helps you with that. So for the purposes of this, you will see me mainly reading from the modern English version. Now, I'll say one thing about that without going too deep into translations. Just pray about it and ask the Lord to just show you because you have to be able to understand, number one, what you read. But what you also have to know is that you wanna understand what is intact as the truth. Not saying that the other translations aren't speaking anything true. It's just the fact that you are relying more so on a paraphrase the further you get from the word for word translation, okay? Um, I'll say this quick aside for those of you who already know it. There are certain Bible translations that are taped uh, based on what we call the majority or the Byzantine text type. That's just saying that out of all of the archeological finds, that around 5,000 of those archeological finds um, that they, manuscripts, that they agree, that they agree. So I tend to lean on translations that fall into that category. And that would be the KJV, that would be the modern English version, the New King James version, uh, the literal standard version. Those are the ones that I tend to lean on. More of the modern uh, translations are based on what they call the critical text, but I won't get into that. You do your own research and just see where you fall. So for today, I just want you to know you're going to be hearing from the modern English version that reads very closely. Um, that if you're reading KJV, it should be very easy for you to follow along. Okay, for day one, 
again, I want to explain to you that when you hover on the modern English version on the U version app, they will give you cross references when you hover over them. We're not going to stop and look at those cross references because we're going to look at study, uh, our reading the word in two phases. We read and then we study. We want to do both. We want to read and then we want to study. For me, it has worked best that I keep my, my first run through of reading separate from studying. You have to determine what's best for you. You know, you, yours, you may read one day and then you may study what you read the second day. Okay. That's typically what I tend to do. If you have a lot of time, you probably can do it all in one day, read and then dive deeper. Um, and when I say that, um, I'm saying that as the Holy spirit highlights a particular chapter that you've read in this chronological Bible reading plan, there might be one section or one passage that you dive deeper into and you look up cross references and you read commentaries because that part is important too. Okay. All right. So let's, with that said, that's out of the way. Just let's get started with our, um, second portion. This is eight sections on this day. And we're going to look at the second section, which is John tap chapter one verses one through four. And then now you're going to see how it's different from the traditional uh, way that we read because now we're in John. It says in the beginning. So that's why it hooks up with Genesis in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were created through him and without him, nothing was created that was created in him was life and the life was the light of mankind. The light shines in darkness, but the darkness has not overcome it. And so even y'all, I can be tempted, you know, to, to want to, to delve into that. So for today, since this is our foundational video, so you can just understand how we're going to approach this, I'm not going to do what I would normally do. Okay. So like, um, as God leads, this will not be a time where I will teach. Remember those will be a separate video, but as God leads, as we're reading, there will be times where I will highlight or ask you to highlight, or I might exhort and encourage because there's a revelation that has come, you know, while reading, like even now, when you look at this, you should know from Genesis, when he said, let us, let us, let us, well, John tells you who the us is, right? It says in the beginning, God, he was in the beginning with God. Well, that's verse two. We know it's uh, Jesus that he's talking about and we know the Holy Spirit was there. So again, I, I can't be tempted to go in. We just going to read today, but I just want to show you exactly how this works, how the chronological um, system is going to work for us. So let's go to our next uh, portion for that day. And this is part three of eight. I'm still in Genesis. Now I'm in Genesis one and we're going to read through all of Genesis one. So let's begin the creation in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was moving over the surface of the water. Y'all, I can't help it. I'm so tempted, but you see that spirit of God right? So we know from John in the beginning, he was with God. So we know God, we know Jesus, and we know the spirit of God. All right, stop it. Let me keep reading. Verse three, God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Then God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. Verse seven. So God made the expanse and separated the waters, which were under the expanse from the waters, which were above the expanse. And it was so God called the expanse heaven. So the evening and the morning were the second day. Then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place. And let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. Then God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth produce vegetation, 
plants yielding seed and fruit trees on the earth yielding fruit after their kind with seed in them. And it was so. The earth produced vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind and trees yielding fruit with seed in them after their kind. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be signs to indicate seasons and days and years. Let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. Then God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. Then God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Then God said, Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters swarmed according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. So the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Then God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. So God made the beasts of the earth according to their kind and the livestock according to their kind and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them and God blessed him and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed which is on the face of all the earth and every tree which has fruit yielding seed. It shall be food for you. To every beast of the earth and to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth which has the breath of life in it, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he made and behold, it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So here we go. We're continuing on. Section four of eight, we are in part one, reading Genesis chapter two. Now notice, see where they start in Genesis two? They don't start at verse one, they start at verse four. It says, this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, no shrub of the field was yet on the earth. And no plant of the field had yet sprouted for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth. And then there was no man to cultivate the ground. Let me make sure y'all want to make sure I was um, in the right order. Okay. Verse six, but a mist arose from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils, the breath of life. And man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden in the east in Eden. And there he placed the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground, the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, along with the tree of knowledge of good and evil. 
A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon. It encompasses the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Bedellum and the oink stone are there, or onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It encompasses, sorry, the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris. It goes toward the east of Assyria. The fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall on Adam and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman and he brought her to the man. Then Adam said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She will be called woman for she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man will cleave his, leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they will become one flesh. They were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. So there we go. We're progressing straight along the way, but I want to scroll up here because that helps us keep our spot. That was four of eight. We're going to continue on, and we just have a few more sections to go. So we are looking at section five, still on day one. So now we're looking at Genesis uh, two and it says, so the heavens and the earth and all their hosts were finished. So you can see that this is not the standard or order. On the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he had rested from all his work, which he had created and made. So that is section uh, five. And you see how they've re-put it into perspective for us. And they end that narrative with God resting on the seventh day. So let's continue with, we're, we're looking at actually, uh, actually six. We're looking at, let me make sure here. We should be at six. All right. Yeah, we read five. And so we're looking at uh, uh, section six. So again, we're ending with five. We're going on with uh, six. It throws me off a little bit because um, mine are already checked based on what uh, I had read previously. So this is six. And as we move on, remember, it's going to show up differently on your phone app, your, your app on your phone or tablet. So it reads in Isaiah 14, we're starting at verse 12. So check this out, how, you're, how, how we're doing this. How are you fallen from heaven? Well, that's your, that's your highlight, I'm sorry. I might as well show you that while I can. If you click on it, you can highlight your in different colors, copy on the app. You can also uh, create a note. And that's why I said it's important for you to create an account. All right, let's continue with Isaiah 14, verse 12. How are you fallen from heaven, O shiny one? Now, remember in our devotional, they told us he's there. He's talking about um, Lucifer, the devil. It says, how are you fallen from heaven, O shiny one, son of the morning? How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations? For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also on the mount of the congregation and the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. 
I will be like the most high. So there it is. There's our problem. That's why we're all in this mess. Okay. So here we go. Now we're going to Ezekiel chapter 28 verses 11 through 15. Now remember we saw that Isaiah was a reference to Isaiah 14, laying the foundation of what happened. You know, how did the serpent end up there in the garden? So here we go. Verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord, this is Ezekiel, came to me saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation over the king of, T of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God. Now, remember in our devotional, he said that the king of Tyre is a reference, they believe the scholars, to Satan. So here it is when we read about this. You had, Satan, the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, the topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the oinks, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of your settings and sockets was in you. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were the anointed cherub that covers, and I set you there. You were upon the holy mountain of God. You walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. You were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created until iniquity was found in you. That's We are laying the foundation, y'all. Here's the last section. And so you'll see when I, as you get used to it, I won't have to do so much ex explaining in um, some instances unless the Lord is leading me to encourage, exhort, or point something out specific. So we're going to end with Genesis chapter 3. Again, I'm reading in the modern English version of the Bible. And it says the fall. Now we can see how this falls in now, you know, now when you see those words, now the serpent, we've already laid the foundation of how this has happened. So it says, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God said, you shall not eat of any tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit from the trees of the garden. But from the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you will not eat of it, nor will you touch it or else you will die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die for God knows that on the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasing to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she gave to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were open and they knew that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. The Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? He said, I heard your voice in the garden and was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what have you done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed above all livestock, livestock and above every beast of the field. You will go on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth and in pain you will bring forth children. Your desire will be for your husband 
and he will rule over you. And to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you saying, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground on account of you in hard labor. You will eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it will bring forth for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face, and will, you will eat bread until you return to the ground, because out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you will return. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. The Lord God made garments of skins for both Adam and his wife and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now he might reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. He drove the man out and at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword which turned in every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. So as we hit continue, this is what you should see. Day one, complete. So I hope, and again, let me reiterate for you, this is reading the Bible in historical sequence, part one. There are 12 parts and each part is designed to last about 30 to 31 days. So I pray you have been blessed by this and we're going to jump in and like uh, if you saw the Democratic National Convention where Michelle Obama said, do something. Well, here's our do something, but we're just relating it to the kingdom and hopefully our doing something in the kingdom will do, end up doing something for all the earth, for all the entire world. So I pray you have been blessed by this. We're jumping in, y'all, starting a new journey. I pray for you that you will have good success and pray for me that the Lord's hand will be upon me to continue to do this, to be faithful to it, and to be committed. So these things we pray. I, I pray that the blessing continues to rest and abide and operate on your behalf. In Christ we pray, amen. So if you're under the sound of my voice, uh, I don't believe that it is an accident. Um, this is an invitation given to you. I believe the Lord has ordered your steps at this time and this moment that he extends a salvation invitation to you. And so I'm going to walk you through this. And the reason why we're going to do this at the beginning is because in his word, it says the carnal mind cannot receive the things of God. And so by new life or what they call the zo or what we call the Zoe life coming into you, then all the teaching that you receive after this will begin to just, uh, produce fruit in your life and you will see the Bible come alive in a new way. It says that he opens their minds so that they can understand the scriptures. So I'm going to be reading from you, for you a few verses in these two chapters. It says John chapter three and Romans 10. I'm reading out of the modern English version. If you, um, as soon as you can get a hand, uh, your Bible, get a Bible. Um, you can find uh, several translations on you version. Some translations that I would recommend to you is one's called the modern English version. Another one's called the amplified classic version. If you feel, um, uh, that you can do the King James version and that the language doesn't, uh, make it hard for you, you can try that. You can try the new King James version. Okay. So after you say yes, that's the first thing you want to do is start to develop a relationship with the word of God. And so I'm going to walk you through this. And again, bear with me. I'm going to read a few verses for you. So you'll get a sound understanding of what has taken place today. And I want to say congratulations to you ahead of time. So again, I'm going to start with uh, John chapter three, and this is just to, just a brief background. This is where you will come across 
that Jesus Christ is speaking with a man uh, named Nicodemus. Okay, so I'm going to start with verse three. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the, the kingdom of God. Okay. And so that's why your invitation is coming today so that you will be translated from darkness to light, that you will be a new member in the kingdom of God. Verse five says, Jesus answered truly, truly again, I'm going to read it, uh, say it to you again. So he says it in verse three and then verse five, listen to this. Jesus answered truly, truly, I say to you, unless a man is born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And so one thing you want to do is, um, as soon as you can, pray about it, uh, be led to a local church of yours where you can be baptized. This just kind of, it, it shows that you've given your life over to Christ, that you're repenting, that you're turning to his way, that the old man is going down in the water and by the power of God, the new man is coming up out of the water. Um, and again, uh, we won't go through all the discussions about salvation and needing to be baptized. If you are able to be baptized, I suggest, I not suggest go ahead and get baptized. Okay. This, you, you will just, it'll just, um, the ceremonial aspect of it, uh, you will see it. It's just something that you, you, you'll remember the rest of your life, you know, bring your family, bring your friends to, uh, celebrate this time with you. All right, let's continue on verse 13. No one has ascended. This is Jesus speaking to heaven, except he who descended from heaven, even the son of man who is in heaven. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up. Now here he's talking about his death, burial, and resurrection. Verse 15, that whoever, here's where you come in, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but may have eternal life. That's how much Christ loves you, that he gave his life for your life. He is the substitution for our sins. Verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So that's the part you want to realize today. It says it takes belief. Whoever believes in him should not perish. By you saying yes today, you will be given eternal life and you will not perish ever. Verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Again, that's you just say yes. Verse 18, he who believes in him is not condemned. So once you say that you believe in the savior, you are no longer condemned. Continuing, but he who does not believe is condemned already. So anyone who's saying no to Christ lives under condemnation, okay? Because, and he tells you why in verse 18, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. Okay, I'm still reading in uh, John chapter three. And so I end this chapter with verse 21. But he who does the truth comes to the light that it may be revealed that his deeds have been done in God. So in other words, that's just a continuation of the discussion that he's talking about hating light and, and the one who uh, hates evil. So read that in your own time, but I want to make sure that you fully understand what's taking place for you today. So we're going to go now to Romans chapter uh, 10. We're going to pick it up with verse eight. But what does it say? The word is near you and in your mouth and in your heart. This is the word of faith that we preach. Now you're receiving the preach word right now. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. So in John 3, we get the reasons for you to have eternal life, for you not to be condemned, for you not to be separated from God. That Jesus Christ becomes your substitution. 
Okay. Now in Romans 10, you're also given um, an elaboration of the process. In John 3, he tells you just believe. And then when we come to Romans 10, he tells us how, verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You will be saved. There's two parts to that. Okay. We confess with our mouth and we always will believe that God raised him from the dead. Those two taking place, you will be saved. And then verse 10, he tells you how again, for with the heart, one believes unto righteousness. You don't really receive this intellectually. Okay. As of today, and for the, for the rest of your life, don't try to receive this intellectually. It is what you believe with your heart. Okay, let me continue. And with the mouth, confession is made into salvation. That part I'm going to help you with. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be ashamed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is generous toward all who call upon him for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So again, if you're under the sound of my uh, voice right now and you're not saved, you have not received the gift of eternal life. uh, I say, just say yes to Christ. So just repeat after me. We're going to use the scripture that we just read and just repeat after me. Heavenly father, I thank you for allowing me to hear the word of faith preached to me. Father, you said, if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, I will be saved. So today, Father, I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. Father, I also believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. And because of that, I receive the gift of salvation and eternal life. So Father, again, I thank you for coming into my life this day and giving me the gift of salvation. Today, Father, According to Romans 10, verse 13, I call on your name. Thank you, Father, for saving me. In Christ we pray. Amen. So right now, the angels are rejoicing over you. I am rejoicing with you. The kingdom believers are will pray for you. Uh, one of the instructions I would give, again, is find, pray about it. Uh, find a, a local church, um, speak to the leadership there, the pastor there, tell them your experience and that you would like to um, be baptized, to be baptized. And also that you also ask, and I can um, speak with this through with you, and that is just ask the Father right now. It can happen all in one setting. There is a receiving of the Holy Spirit, and then there's a coming upon by the Holy Spirit. And you'll see this in Acts chapter two. So if you even want to receive this right now where you are, I'm believing God that father, you baptize them with the power of your Holy Spirit as you did your apostles and the believers in the upper room in Acts chapter two. Father, they have received your Holy Spirit within. Now we're asking you to baptize them with the power of your spirit, that they be endued with power from on high, We pray that there be an overflow of the Holy Spirit upon their life like never before. So, Father, we ask that you lead them to a local, believing, loving, Christ-centered, teaching, obedient church, Father. That they may be discipled and mentored and walk in the victory that you've accomplished for them through their blood, through your blood, Father. And so we thank you, Father. We're believing by faith that they are baptized by the Holy Spirit right as we speak, that fire comes down upon them right as we speak, Father. And we just give you all the glory for it in advance. 
for it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen. Now I'm rejoicing with you. Be blessed. Mark this day. Take a moment and write it in your phone, a sheet of paper. This is the day that I was birthed into the kingdom of God today. This is the day. And I won't give you today's date because I don't know what date you're going to receive, uh, hear this. But today is the day that I receive new Zoe life in Christ. I'm smiling from ear to ear. Be blessed in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you.